Morning. Our second speaker this morning is Dr. Max Rempel. He got his PhD in molecular biology in Russia in 1994 and has been researching DNA resonance and electromagnetic therapy since 1999. His mainstream publications have been cited over 2,000 times and he has published three books in the alternative field. He also is the co-founder of a thriving online community, Hucolo, H-U-C-O-L-O, and his website is dnaresonance.org. Please welcome Dr. Max Rempel. Uh, thank you very much. How did you like the rain yesterday? Um, I just wonder maybe the, some of the field generators on this conference, on this Congress, maybe they were responsible for making this rain. Or maybe it is a combination, so I'm thankful for that. And I'm grateful for meeting you all. And um, uh, it's nice to be not lonely on the fringe, but uh, see the sense of the community. So today, um, today I will be talking about uh, three, uh, uh, three, three parts, DNA resonance, DNA resonance code, and telepathy. Um, let's start from a very simplistic experiment. Um, you, you, um, it is published by Burla Burlakov in Russia, and uh, we are trying now to reproduce this experiment. Um, you take fish embryos, fertilized fish embryos, and put them into the quartz cuvettes, and the uh, uh, top cuvette contains older embryos, and bottom cuvette contains younger ones, like uh, just freshly fertilized a few minutes ago. And you put them in a box and let them grow together, and you find that the older ones repress the younger ones, and the communication between them happens only through through the wall, through the quartz wall. Um, and then if you put a filter, the communication stops and this effect is stopped. So this is well published, well reproduced, and uh, this is one of the strongest evidence for uh, biological field and strongest evidence for the electromagnetic nature of the uh, biofield. Um, I summarize here the reviews and publications, and uh, if you want to start, I would recommend David Wilcox Source Field Investigations. And this slide you can find on my site, I just uploaded it there, um, dnaresonance.org. Um, the pioneer in, the, in this research is Alexander Gurvich, and uh, he, is, uh, he has been nominated for the Nobel Prize 11 times in the West, and if he got it, if he would get it, then that would change the history of the humanity. But um, you know, all this research, as, as usual, was repressed. So he formulated the um, concept of morphogenic field. Morph stands for shape, and genic st stands for producing. So the field which produces the shape of the body. And also he, he uh, coined the term mitogenic radiation, meaning that the radiation which causes mitosis and accelerates the cell growth, uh, cell division. Uh, his main experiment was very simplistic and it was reproduced by others and it was done, started do, he started doing it in 1912, over 100 years ago, and he published it 1988 years ago. Um, and it was reproduced and um, it's still being reproduced. So you take the onion, onion is a good uh, model because it's self-contained, it has all nutrients and uh, when it starts to grow, the roots grow really fast. He put um, in between the two onions, one onion and another one, put a prism so he could separate the light into the spectrum and he could measure how the light from one root affects the growth, um, the growth of the another root, the speed of the growth. And he could map the lines of the spectrum which of the spectral lines would be transmitting the mitogenic radiation. And the range is around 200 nanometers, surprisingly, so it is pretty uh, hard UV light, but very soft. So that's a clue because DNA absorbs strongly UV light, so that DNA might be involved. At that time, DNA wasn't even on the horizon. 
Uh, and this work lasted for about, uh, from 1912 to exactly 1948, when it was repressed, the lab was closed. But then his daughter in 1962, 15 years later, uh, resumed the research, restored the research, and uh, the tradition continues. And now the Burlakov's lab for, for the last 30 years uh, is doing experiments of that kind. And we are in communication with them. Uh, we already bought this uh, retro quartz retro reflector. We bought the germanium mirror. I'm now doing a collaboration with the lab which grows fish embryos, and we are planning to reproduce these experiments here and expand from there. But basically the idea is that if you take fish embryos and give them a mirror, the mirror somehow reflects the light back, but also it distorts the light. So the fish embryos from germanium mirror accelerate their growth in Burlakov's experiments, and statistically significantly, and um, if you give it a retro reflector, which is a funny mirror, turning all, all the images upside down and uh, inside out, uh, you get the repression, and most importantly, you get uh, developmental abnormalities, meaning that the embryos develop incorrectly, and this strongly suggests to us that we're dealing with a morphogenic field, that it is the field which is responsible for the uh, shape of the body, and also, if you start putting different filters here, you can actually start deciphering the frequencies. I should mention the experiments of uh, Benveniste and Montagnier, where they took the DNA, uh, activated it in, using electromagnetic field, measured, uh, measured and recorded the pattern using a simplistic electromagnetic device, transferred to another device, reproduce the electromagnetic pattern and recreate the structure of the DNA in another sample. So this is about where we, uh, we, where we are experimentally. So direct experimental experience ends here. There is, the rest of the talk is mostly about experiments of others and conjectures and logic and doing the theory and uh, trying to project things forward. There is very little experimentation that is done to confirm uh, the involvement of DNA in morphogenic field and body shape. So DNA is clearly involved into shaping the body chemically. That's very well proven. It's very obvious that uh, the genome defines the shape and the function. Now the DNA creates morphogenic field. There is very little evidence except the previous slide. They did some of the experiments showing that there is a field from the DNA which is important. And um, the fact that morphogenic field defines body shape, there is uh, not much experimental evidence published. So uh, when talking about DNA, my experience is relevant. I uh, have a, a master's in uh, DNA chemistry and a PhD in gene biology from Russia. I did postdoc in America on genomic gene regulation animal models. And since 2008, I'm running uh, by biomedical startups funded uh, by um, federal government for, th for the development of therapeutic electromagnetic devices targeting DNA. So uh, what is nice, nice about DNA that is tangible? It is something in biology which is really, you can touch it, you can extract it, you can see it, you can do crystallography, and it's very digital. The, it's the analysis of individual bases of the DNA, and you can see they are very digital. It's the most digital side of the biology. Everything else is much more field-like and fluid-like, but DNA is very structured. And the structure of it is very consistent. It's, uh, if you see the uh, two strands of the DNA, two helical strands, it's a right handed helix like a normal screw. If you see it's other way around, left handed screw, it's just an incorrect painting of the DNA. Almost 50% of the paintings of DNA and photographs are incorrect. So this is the right one. Exact. And it has monomers called nucleotides. And these are very chemical, very well defined. And there is a 10 and a half nucleotides per turn. So that's also important. And also on a good structure, you can see that these strings are a little closer to each other and there is a bigger gap here called major groove. So it's, it's very, uh, there is a little space here so the sequence can be accessed from outside. 
Uh, there is a lot of information about DNA publicly available, and this is one of the best browsers, you know, University of California Santa Cruz genome browser, so you can access many genomes, many sequences, and there is lots of annotation, lots of data brought together uh, from a, a human, monkey, mouse, dog, elephant, chicken, and so on, and it's all compared together. A lot of chemical information is there. No field information, no resonance information, but chemically it's a treasure trove, a lot of nice information there. So if you start looking closely at it, uh, it has genes, so the sequence contains non-coding DNA, non-coding DNA, DNA that codes the RNA, and RNA which is translated to genes. So DNA is transcribed to RNA, RNA is translated to the protein, so this little piece, little bar, is what, is what we understand really well chemically. This is the sequence, which is protein coding, one and a half percent. We really understand the code. Three nucleotides make an amino acid, and it is understood. The rest, uh, the language is not understood. It is up to deciphering. We still don't understand the genome, although it's available for uh, 18 years now. So if you zoom in, you can see the sequence, A, G, G, T, C, T, G, 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 C, A, four letters, A, G, C, T, and we still cannot read it. Um, so the mystery is in the genome. So we look at the fish embryo development. It starts from one cell containing the DNA. It divides into two cells. You see two cells here, and each of the cells has a copy of the genome. Then four cells, eight cells, 12, uh, 16, here is about 128 cells, and then a mystery happens, like this simple blob is shaped in like a few minutes, it makes a shape of the body, and in a few hours you get a full shape of the body, and chemical explanation of this shaping of the body, morphogenesis, is insufficient, we believe it's insufficient. There is a field involved, electromagnetics, attraction, driving forces, uh, electromagnetic, electrodynamics, and uh, it's not deciphered yet. There are some works, but uh, not, nothing definitive. So, and the second thing is not enough genes in the human genome. There is only 21,000 protein coding genes, 40,000 RNA coding genes, and that's about it. And complex organisms and simple organisms have about the same number of genes, and it surprises many scientists, even mainstream scientists. Uh, so there is no correlation between the complexity of the body and the number of genes. So there is something between the genes, obviously. So the first publication I found is by Richard Allen Miller on holographic genome, 1973, 45 years ago. And he pronounced everything there with co-authors co um, Bert Webb and Darden Dixon. They said the genomic genome is a holographic mat matrix. It produces a holographic field which defines the shape of the genome and uh, the function of the body, the function of the, the movement of the enzymes and the molecules in the cell is controlled and directed by the hologram, by the DNA-produced holographic field, and this holographic field makes, the, makes up the mind. So everything was pronounced 45 years ago. Uh, 20 years later, Peter Garyaev wrote the book Wave Genome, and five, later, five years later, a friend gave it to me, so that's when I was initiated about um, 19 years ago. I was initiated into this theory. Uh, the next year, 95, um, Marco Bischoff published a book where he pronounces, again, that DNA makes a field which is um, dynamic web of light. It, uh, it makes the shape of the body through morphogenesis, and... Uh, it makes the holographic biophoton field of the brain. It's kind of well accepted outside of the mainstream science, but there is still a way, way to go to prove it. Uh, now, Constantin Mile uh, spoke, spoke on, the, on this conference, and uh, he brought some physics into this understanding. He explained how is it possible that the waves could interact with uh, such shapes of the cells and the tissues which are not regular are made of liquid and absorb 
things and don't look like crystals, so don't look like regular crystals. So he explained that the, the waves in the physical waves in the body would be of special nature. They wouldn't be periodic, they would be irregular, and they could be uh, helical, and um, they wouldn't have a constant fixed wavelength or even possibly frequency. It would be a frequency range and, fre f and range of wavelengths. And they possibly would go uh, into a point and expand into a point and expand. So they will uh, in some way resemble the DNA and other molecules. Uh, so I was very happy to, know, to understand from his teachings, from his books, that there is possibly still an electromagnetic. It's still achievable to describe electromagnetically and quantum physically that these waves, the biological field waves. So uh, I have to define the DNA resonance. So Let's look at the two guitars. If you uh, um, activate one, one of them, the second one would capture the wave and get a little bit of the sound of the same frequency, if they're identical, if they're tuned into to the same frequency. So I, I, I would say that identical DNA sequences, TAACC, would uh, also resonate. So I would do, uh, uh, describe it as um, identical structures resonate and they also synchronize, and they can transfer information. So you activate one, the information is transferred to another. Now think about two different instruments, like a sax and a guitar. If you make a right note, the guitar would also capture this, the sound and also resonate. So it's not necessary for the structures to be identical. The only requirement is that they would have to support identical oscillations. So different structures like TACC and CACC, if it is methylated, they would, I predict from the modeling that they would have similar electronic structures, although different atom positions, but electron oscillation structures would be similar and then they could also resonate. So, so that's also part of the DNA resonance definition. So this slide is from a talk uh, 15 years ago, which I presented. Um, about DNA resonance. Here are a couple of kind of highlights. Uh, from the biology, we know that, that the DNA is actually packed into chromatin. It's, it's not naked in, uh, in our cells. It's wrapped around protein uh, drums, which are called nucleosomes. And uh, th I suggested that this is a resonating unit of the DNA. And also, I noticed that when we talk on our cell phones or through the radio, we use energy. So the cell phone uses the battery to send the signal, and another cell phone would use the battery to receive the signal. So there is some energy involved to amplify the signal. So the model here is some chemical signal binds to the nucleosome. So there is a chemical signal transmitted through a wave to a similar structure, and then it converts back to the chemical signal. So chemical to the electromagnetic to the chemical and we use uh, chemical energy, ATP, to drive that process. So there would be some uh, devices, nano-devices, natural electrochemical devices, which would be responsible for making it happen. It just doesn't happen by itself. There should be some structure supporting the communication. That was my prediction. And it pretty, pretty much stays. So here is a summary. Um, so DNA. Uh, we predict would create morphic field or morphogenic field, same thing, and uh, this morphogenic field will talk back to the DNA, would talk to the body structure and define the body structure. It would drive the biochemical factor inside the cell, outside of the cell. It would drive the behavioral chemistry and it would make the mind happen. So mind and morphogenic field, we believe, is the same thing. It's uh, electrochemical and not also um, it has a resonance property. Nothing surprising to you, but uh, it still remains to be proven experimentally to the mainstream science. So now I noticed that this uh, summary comes in agreement with the traditional uh, esoteric uh, Eastern medicine where they have defined etheric body, which is basically the field which um, defines the shape of the body and is responsible for health, for biochemistry. Emotional body, which is responsible for emotions, behavioral chemistry. And mental body, which is responsible for the mind. So here we come to their 
agreement with the tradition. So, and um, possibly we can prove these bodies actually exist. And they're represented by certain types of the waves, structures of the waves, waves and frequencies of the waves. Also, there are experiments which prove, starting from Carl June and uh, now um, Sheldrake are talking about, and not actually talking, experimentally prove that there is a connection between the physical mind, local individual mind, and a collective subconscious or collective mind, and the transmission of information is proven through experiments in telepathy by Sheldrake, statistically very significant, extrasensory perceptions experiments and, um, and other experiments in this area. So Sheldrake basically suggests that there are uh, the mind and collective mind and individual mind um, are somehow connected. Uh, I highly recommend his um, books, Morphic Resonance, published in 81 and still uh, is an updated and there is a new version. Now on this picture, trying to put some physics and frequencies on this picture. So uh, this part is clearly by electrochemical, electrochemical. Mind is an electrochemical machine, for sure. Everything else is tangible. Body is very material. So it's electrochemical. Now, the DNA is also electrochemical, clearly. Now, the rest is morphic field. We call it morphic field. And uh, there is a clearly an electromagnetic component, which is proven by the experiments which I showed you previously, that there is a transmission of the waves from one cuvette to another. And, uh, and that's where the, the proof ends. So now the quantum physics, or you can call this, there are many other types of their names, say uh, torsion field or scalar waves, uh, some quantum physical uh, mysterious field, but it's still local, it's still in the body, which is responsible for etheric body, emotional body, mental body. And there is a collective morphic field, and what is interesting about it, it's, it seems to be in another dimension. It's not local. Their telepathy is not blocked by any electro electromagnetic shield. So there, is, there are experiments where telepaths are placed in the underground, isolated, insulated from an, all electromagnetics, and the um, transmission is not blocked by the shield, and also it's not dependent on the distance. So it's the, the, the space factor is out of the question there. It's, it's, it's all everywhere. And the same thing is with extra uh, ESP experiments. So DNA seems to be traversing and uh, uniting all of those levels. It is clearly tangible, you can photograph it, you can touch it. It, it. it hasn't been proven much, but the experiments of Montaigne show that there is some electromagnetic component to, to the DNA. And uh, DNA is known to be an electric conductor, which is very exciting for us and for electrical engineers. It's a good semiconductor and a good electric conductor. Um, then uh, possibly there are torsion or scalar waves in the DNA, and um, maybe it also plugs us into the collective field. And together, collectively, we, uni we are united by the same similar sequence of the human genome. So there is a field of the so many billions of humans having the same sequence. And maybe that's the reason we extinguished all other competitors, which were humanoids like um, an, um, primates, other primates, because they interfere with our collective field, possibly. Not that it was good, but it is a nice uh, hypothesis. So I was excited at some point about red light therapy. And I was thinking that red light possibly is the frequency where DNA resonates. So we did experiments on mice and uh, cells, and we demonstrated that um, when, if you radiate the, the mice with red light in the skin, you get activation of certain genes, like interferon gamma, so you can measure it. And uh, the mice were radiated uh, in a chamber, full body radiation. We also, uh, I was hoping to be able to cure cancer with, uh, with red light therapy, and uh, we did a pretty big experiment with, on mice with, um, with red light. Unfortunately, it didn't cure cancer. Uh, the, the, Treated mice and non-treated mice had the same rate of the, 
of the uh, cancer growth, but you can visually see the difference between the mice. The mice which were treated were happy and healthy and ran around, although the tumors were big, they were behaving like, like healthy, and untreated mice like, were nearly dead all the time. They were purple and unhappy. Um, thinking about the wavelength, um, the, the wavelength of the light was 660 nanometers. And if you look at the DNA size, it would correspond to about 2,000 nucleotides of DNA, which gives us some candidate size of the sequences. So we have in mind a candidate sequence which could be a responsible unit of the DNA for interaction with the red light and producing some sort of communication through the red light. Interestingly, uh, if you look about, think about the frequencies, some of the frequencies pass through the body without even touching it. Some of them are absorb the surface and some kind of penetrate a little bit. So red light is penetrating about, I would say, up to three centimeters more or less. So it would be good for communication between the cells within the tissue, but not any, any on the farther distances. So now we are experimenting with millimeter wave therapy, which is about 10,000 bigger wavelength. And it is also very exciting because um, it is very therapeutic. Uh, the devices are popular in Russia and Eastern Europe, uh, approved by uh, their Ministry of Health. Uh, it, it uses 42.2 gigahertz, 7 millimeters uh, wavelength. Uh, low power irradiation applied to acupuncture points produces pain relief, uh, helps with arthritis and psychology, psychiatric problems, stress as well. Um, so I was thinking that DNA might be also be a target of those. Uh, we are doing our experiments um, with the most sophisticated device, also made in Russia, which, which allows us to do the spectral uh, from 37 um, gigahertz to 50 gigahertz. And it looks like the, uh, this irradiation uh, induces compaction of DNA in cells. It's still preliminary, we didn't publish that yet. So here I just wanted to show you some of the candidate frequencies. It starts with UV from Gurvich experiments, uh, low-level light therapy like red light. Then it goes to millimeter wave therapy and it goes to ultra-high frequency therapy, which is very popular in Russia. We estimate that there is about a million people treated with a millimeter wave therapy. It's accessible for purchase at home, uh, to use at home, and ultra-high frequency therapy, like more like 10 to 30 million were treated. And a low frequency, like sound frequency, electromagnetic therapy is also of, of importance. And um, you can see that microwave cell phones are all around the place. So maybe, we, maybe those are dangerous and also maybe those are therapeutic. We, we don't actually know. There is not much good research on that. So next I will talk about actually cracking, deciphering the DNA resonance code. I'm good on time. So about one third through. Um, any questions so far? So um, everybody agrees the DNA is a computer. The genome, a computer is a good analogy for the genome. It is a program. Even mainstream science accepts that DNA is a program. Like they think about chemical program, but we think about more like about vibrational program. It has, it is memory. And it, is chem it has chemical memory. There is a chemical way to read, write, read and write the information from the DNA on onto the DNA through the methylation. So DNA sequence can be actually methylated by enzymes, and there is a write mechanism. Um, it has chemical logic, so something binds to DNA, and its function changes. And also there is, we believe, there would be a vibrational logic in the DNA. And because it is electroconductive, we are looking for electric circuits like transistors in DNA structures. It's not published yet, but the idea is around. Can you assemble, uh, is, is, uh, does the natural DNA assemble into a transistor-like structure? So it's possibly a chemical uh, circuit, circuitry. Then um, DNA has a perfect way of addressing. It's one of the most exciting wonderful things about DNA. Uh, a 20 nucleotide, 20 base oligonucleotide can find its place in a genome which is 3 billion bases in seconds 
And obviously chemists say it's, it's all random, but we of course believe that there is some directional guidance by morphic field of this oligonucleotide to its proper place in the, in the genome. And uh, also there is the idea that the DNA is fractal. Let me talk about that a little bit. So to define fractal, it is the next member of the of their sequence is proportionally bigger or smaller than the previous member. So that's a definition of a fractal. And notice that it could be fractal in space, but you're also a fractal of yourself in time. You are proportional to yourself every year, just growing bigger and bigger, and then maybe smaller and smaller. So Dan Winter is the main uh, teacher about holographic and fractal principle in DNA. He talks a lot about it. He also brings golden mean ratio here. And um, that's his picture explaining, I think it's a wonderful picture, how it actually might look in real life. It's obviously, I'm looking for this picture, for this structure in DNA, and I cannot find it in physical DNA. I don't see this structure. But um, in electromagnetic field of the DNA, I was very excited when I saw something resembling this. So it's, it's a helix, but also it comes to the point. And um, Ben Winter says that this point is where our physical field, electromagnetic field, goes through, not, uh, goes through dimensions, and that's the point of transdimensional information transfer. And that's how the DNA connects us to the higher dimensions. So I think um, this, I will come a little, uh, in the next few slides I will show you the structure which might be responsible for creating the field, a vortex field similar to that, possibly. Nothing proven yet. I was very excited to see that a mainstream scientist uh, published something on, um, on fractality of the DNA. So Eric Lander is one of the fathers of the human genome. His, his name is first on the publication of the public human genome project. And what is nice about Eric Lander, when we come to a certain point in science, in mainstream science, we discover that he published the first paper on that many years ago. So he, he always like about 15, 20 years ahead of everybody. So when he published in 2009, so on, uh, in 2009 on, on fractal principle, it was very, very exciting. Um, so now holographic principle, you're actually familiar with some of the holographic images. Uh, so one of the principles of holography, it, it is redundant. A part of the holo hologram contains the whole and it is uh, uh, resistant to damage. It's tolerant to damage. So these QR images are messed up in different ways and they're all readable by the cell phone. You can read them. It's uh, the same uh, pattern, just uh, you can type over it, you can add something, you can uh, diffuse it, it's all readable. So we believe that principle also relates to the DNA. What is missing here is the wave uh, wave resonance. It's not a resonance pattern, it's just digital pattern which is messed up. So um, here is a, uh, some sort of a picture of a hologram which is hard to show on a 2D screen, but basically in reading of the hologram you use the, the wave pattern interference. That's as far as I understand the holography. So which um, structures in DNA are candidates for creating this holographic pattern and talking to their field. So obviously the double helix is a very beautiful, perfect structure capable of resonance and there is a lot of publications trying to decipher which of the resonance things, are, resonances processes happen there. So many scientists believe it could be mechanical, which I doubt, because in viscous water medium uh, all the mechanical oscillation would fade right away. So I believe the oscillation happens inside and it happens electronically, not mechanically. The next structure is DNA wrapped around the protein called nucleosome. And then there is dinucleosomal patterns and then they are combined in the next uh, more bigger, bigger, bigger structures. Unfortunately for my research, starting from four nucleosomes, this structure is not regular, not periodic. If there is resonance there, it is not through mechanical periodicity in it. And maybe inside of it there is some order, but we cannot find any order above four nucleosomes, basically above 500 nucleotides. And the size of the nucleus of the chromosome is about um, 
100 million nucleotides, which is about 10 centimeter length if you stretch it, uh, um, stretch it into a line. So possibly there is a wave process happens, happening through different pathways through the length of the DNA. It's one molecule just compacted from 10 centimeters to about less than angstrom. And um, if it is a 10 centimeter resonator, maybe that would result in a 10 centimeter wavelength, which is not necessarily true, but you can put some number on electromagnetic patterns, even of chromosome resonance. So this is my model, which I published last year, just one of them. So this is DNA wrapped around nucleosomes, and there is animation how charges could travel across the DNA back and forth. So you can see they travel, and there is, uh, they now repel from each other here. And you can see the magnetic lines going forward and then backward. So there is some oscillation of magnetic lines. I don't know if this model is true, but that gives at least the tool how to think about DNA resonance patterns. And obviously this structure has a DNA sequence, and depending on the sequence, it will be structured slightly different. So the sequence would define the electromagnetic oscillation properties of this uh, resonator. Uh, so, by the way, from here, when I combine multiple of those, I just was excited to see that those could create some, something like a stepping motor, which would make the magnetic field go in circles, like rotate, and that kind of calls for the idea of um, Dan Winter's fractal, conical fractal shape. It doesn't have a name yet. Vortex, most, most, most like a vortex coming to a point. So if you combine multiple of those, you can make a vortex coming to a point, which is, could be a transdimensional um, transmitter receiver. Okay, resonance DNA code. So now we're talking about the code. They define the code as an algorithm, fractal and holographic. It doesn't mean that it's not readable, but it is an algorithm which can be read through fractal and holographic mathematical transformations so from a sequence of three billion bases, basically three gigabases or three gigabytes roughly, uh, you can create, decipher it and create a shape of the body. So if it is an elephant genome, you should be able to produce the shape of the body, the shape of the cells, shape of the st structure of the organs, behavior, all the description of the program, how to make an elephant and how it functions. Uh, and if it would be a human, the same thing. Right now, if you give a biologist a sequence of the genome, they wouldn't be able to tell the mouse from a human or even from a simple organism. It's, uh, we don't know the language yet. And you're familiar with that. We can take a QR code, use an algorithm, and produce a word elephant, which is much simpler than the whole elephant. Uh, here, I want to re remind you that there is a lot of chemical information on the map of the genome, so if every sequence, every sequence has a lot of chemical information. Is the sequence uh, conserved through the evolution? Is it similar to a dog, a mouse, and so on? It's, it's uh, accessibility. Is it open, the sequence, or closed, and with different cells, different conditions, different experiments? It's all in public databases. Uh, is it expressed into RNA, or is it not expressed? So all of that is available. We call it genomic annotations, or we call it also, com uh, we use computational genomics to play with these sequences. And there are, I would say, hundreds of thousands bioinformatics scientists looking at it. None of them is looking at resonance. All of them look for candidate sequences to drugs, chemical drugs. So combining those annotations on transcription and accessibility of DNA, is it open and closed, the function so mechanical function of DNA, if you combine it with com quantum chemical molecular modeling, which I showed just before, and it was actually not quantum chemical, but it was molecular modeling of DNA, and with, sim uh, and with the idea that similar s molecular structures would resonate, I would say it's pretty likely to decipher some of the letters of the alphabet of the, ge of the, de of the genome. And if you combine it with experimental genomics where you manipulate the genome, basically you can put the sequence in the mouse, you can take the sequence out of the mouse, you can use the same thing on the cells or on nematode, you can ma manipulate the sequences very easily. 
It costs uh, pretty inexpensive to run those experiments. And also combine it with a spectroscopy where you take a synthetic piece of DNA and just measure its frequencies in the spectroscope. I think it's, it's quite possible. I do think it's possible to crack the resonance code of the genome. You know, if you have enough funding, I think it's pretty doable. And no one is doing it as far as I know. There is no publications. I haven't heard any rumors that anybody is doing it. It's doable. Like if you estimate the number of um, experts in each category, like experts in quantum chemistry, there are 100,000 scientists working on that. Uh, molecular structures, 100,000 scientists working on that. Uh, but, uh, so there is a lot of expertise and no one is combining it together to crack the wave code. Uh, it's still possible. In 1961, um, the protein code was, uh, of DNA was cracked. It happened, uh, did Marshall, uh, Marshall Nirenberg did it uh, at NIH, National Institutes of Health. They have their own internal institute where I also worked. And I saw his lecture. Um, so they took poly U, so a piece of DNA, which is U, 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 uh, very similar to T, 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 and gave it, uh, mixed it with uh, certain enzymes, and uh, the enzymes produced um, polyphenylalanine, basically a sequence of uh, amino acids, which is called peptide, and they were able to tell that U, U, U uh, is a code for phenylalanine. So it was the first letter of the protein code of the genome. And um, then NIH dumped a lot of money in this research and um, with help of other scientists in the, in the world, the uh, protein code was cracked in about two years. So once you get the first letter, once you prove the principle, others will follow. It's, it's only about the first letter to really prove and, uh, convincingly that it is true. Um, and one thing I want to mention that Within the NIH, once you become a PI within NIH Institute, you're free to do, so there is a lot of intellectual freedom there. You're like tenure for life, and you can do a lot of research without much restriction. There is no censorship. You're not dependent on funders. So that makes you think much more freely. So the biggest discovery of the last century in biology was the discovery of the double helix. And what was interesting, neither Crick nor Watson were funded to do it. Crick uh, Watson was actually refused uh, the funding. He was a postdoc, and uh, his supervisors decided that they would not want him to work on the DNA and sent him elsewhere. So he was self-funded. He just had some savings. Where, when he discovered double helix, he was free to do whatever. He had some savings. He was very wise about the money. And um, Crick was also prohibited by his bosses to work on the DNA. He had much more boring project on proteins. So they did it in free time, underground, they hacked the, the, the code. So this, you know, the major discoveries were done by amateurs, people who are not restricted by the funding. And Einstein wasn't funded to, do, to discover his uh, um, theory of re relativity. So that gives you the freedom to think. Um, now, another code which was cracked was Egyptian language. Uh, basically, French, Napoleon went to Egypt to get from there the secrets of their mysteries, the ancient knowledge about mm, Atlanteans and so on. So, uh, Thomas Young uh, found, the, uh, noticed the Rosetta Stone, which had three different languages. One of them was Egyptian and two others were known, and found and deciphered first few letters. And then Champollion um, jumped on that and was able to actually start to read the Egyptian language and taught others how to do that. So we need such a Rosetta Stone for the DNA resonance. And part of that is our annotations in the genome and the public databases. Another approach was also Craig Venter, who uh, was also an alternative scientist. The mainstream academia didn't want to fund his research. And uh, he came up uh, with um, the formula to fund his research by private money. So basically, he was able to, uh, to create the company uh, with the private money, sequence the human genome very fast. In a couple of years, they, they finished it. So they competed with the uh, public genome project. And um, while they 
Venter was sequencing, they sold the sequences to the pharmaceutical companies. And now these sequences actually make money for them. Uh, the new field was developed, it's called biologics. So biologics are very, uh, made a revolution in arthritis therapy and therapy of Crohn's disease and some other, other immuno, immune disorders. So that, actually, uh, that idea actually worked. So uh, I just wanted to mention that if uh, federal money are not available, maybe private money can make the trick. Um, so how much effort is needed to crack the, the code? Uh, I would just start from my own experience. So we need the experts in uh, computational genomics, experimental genomics, quantum chemistry, physics, spectroscopy. If you combine them and give them the direction, so all of these are available, it's not nothing unusual. If you combine them and give them the direction, I would say in five years are they pretty certain to crack the first letter of the, of the code. So that's my estimate, five people for five years, but they have to know what to do. So we did a lot of homework and we're in a unique position because we know where others get it wrong, not only in mainstream they get it wrong, but also even in alternative field, in the fringe science, many, many things are got wrong. So you need to do a lot of homework to know the, where to go. Next, um, applications. Once you crack the code, you can develop electromagnetic drugs. Basically, this would be wearable devices. I call them electromagnetic drugs, but they, actually these are wearable devices, very much like that. And uh, if they can control body structure, the application would be to obesity, cancer because it's change of the shape, and organ engineering. You can grow organs, direct the growth, and possibly grow limbs, and possibly grow new teeth. Uh, biochemical factor can be controlled, so that applies to immunity, arthritis, allergy, infections. Behavioral chemistry can be controlled, depression, schizophrenia, PTSD could be treated, and mind problems like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So the only difference is that you put in this machine some sort of a pattern which is the pattern of the DNA field, which is not deciphered yet. But the physical appearance would be very similar, I would say. Possibly. And now we'll talk about the brain code. So far we just only mentioned the, the brain. Now let's talk more about the brain code. So you notice DNA makes morphogenic field and that makes the mind. So I would just want to focus on this connection. DNA resonance code, I claim, and it is a very profound claim, that DNA resonance code and the brain code speak the same language. Nobody knows that, nobody believes that. It's something new, at least in mainstream, at least in experimental science. I mean, for alternative, I think people know, but they don't know what to do with it. Once you think about DNA code as something tangible, a reach which you can actually develop, understand, discover, then that necessarily will bring us to understanding the brain code. If you decipher DNA code, you will decipher the brain code. So, exciting thing here is while all other research is prohibited, restricted, unfounded, uh, the brain-computer interface is really well funded these days. It's mainstream and uh, mm, peaceful health-related agency and defense agencies all have open programs to develop brain-computer interface. And if you think about brain, computer, brain, which is just double brain computer, it equals telepathy. So I think that's, that is a very exciting opportunity where the interests merge. I will explain a little later about that. So let's think about what is, where the mainstream science gets it wrong. So all of the scientists who are funded to do that, they operate on the paradigm of action potential. So this is sensory neuron, it goes from the skin, so from the, from the finger, sensory nerves, uh, go to the spine where the body of the neuron is, so they're pretty long, it's like two, three, three and a half feet long. So the body is in the spine, the endings, sensory endings are in the skin, and the DNA is in the spine, it's in the body. And this, the sensory endings, 
axons are elsewhere. So people, when the mainstream scientists think about their brain function, their neuronal function, they think that DNA can operate only chemically and can send the signals only in a slow fashion to the ending. So they don't actually think that DNA is any part of the brain process in active thinking. Uh, so action potential is basically electricity, but it's not electricity mm, as in electric wires. It's more like excitement, electric excitement, ch uh, charge, trans charge excitement, which slowly travels through the through their neurons, through the axons. So, and that's what, where we think it's, it's true, but it is incomplete. So, those action potentials, of course, they matter for movement and sensation, but there is also a lot of thinking involved, and we don't believe uh, action potentials are as important for thinking as mainstream science thinks. So, the answer comes from Stuart Hamerov. For the last 30 years, he uh, promotes the idea, and he's very successful to bring in it to the attention of the mainstream science, that microtubules are inside of neurons, actually outside of neurons too, and they are responsible for the transmission of information. Um, here is a microtubule, it's a pretty, it's the structure which is as pretty as DNA, and uh, there is a theory, a little bit of experimental evidence, that it transfers the information. And for those of you who are into water, would be exciting to see, that's my hypothesis, that the uh, microtubule is filled with water, which could be structured by the proteins outside, could be structured in a certain liquid crystal structure, where the protons could be united, distributed into a cloud, united and distributed, so there is no specific position for this proton. It dissociates from the water and becomes quantum distributed into the cloud, and this cloud is linear, and it's known in some other parts of science, it's known as proton highway in the water. So the water creates a proton highway with unified cloud of the protons, so it's an elementary particle which is distributed along long distances, and that would be a great um, pathway, highway for transmitting the information. It's novel here. It's a hypothesis. So chemical resonance is uh, the word which defines this distribution of the electron or proton, and it's known in science in some other areas. And um, the, the key word if you search is nanotubes. So nanotubes, proton highway, you can find it. Uh, I claim also that proton highway might happen in the DNA as well. Unlike microtubules, DNA doesn't contain water in the core. Outside there is lots of water. In the core, there is no space for the water. It's a um, lipid structure called DNA bases. They are aromatic, and they are known to have a cloud of united, unified electrons which are distributed along the DNA. So it's like a laser or like um, a semiconductor where the, ch the information can pass through very easily. So that's well known, the electron uh, unification here, distribution. But proton is not known. So this is what makes them similar. And uh, here is a picture where I was excited to see, so that's the same structure. I was ex uh, looking at uh, the components of this structure, realized they could be magnetic. And uh, the, there, is like the there is a possibility that the um, uh, benzene rings, aromatic rings, are spinning there, producing the magnetic field. And I tried, tried, tried to plot the magnetic field, and I saw that it would be looking in one direction in one strand of DNA, in one strand of DNA, and looking in another direction in another strand of DNA. And some of the nucleotides contain double rings, so the field can be, could be reversing, and it would create a picture like that. So the picture would be like reversed with some loops. So if you look at this structure, uh, it depends on the sequence, of course, and this structure would be possibly a source for magnetic message, and it could be oscillating. So you can actually put a hand and draw the structures of magnetic lines in the DNA. It's all theoretical, but at least it's a wonderful approach to decipher the language and convert from chemical language to the magnetic. So now another big step. I started on um, 9.45. So I have an extra 15 minutes.
I'm good on time. It's all on plan. Okay, um, so another good message. Um, the DNA in the nucleus is possibly connected electromagnetically with microtubules in the axon. It's not published by others, so I, I, I published that. That's a new idea. So possibly these two electromagnetic structures are linked together. And you can see on the photograph, it's known that microtubules surround the nucleus, and there is possibly an interface, electromagnetic, not mechanical, not chemical, but electromagnetic interface between microtubules and DNA. So then the morphic field created by the DNA doesn't just fly everywhere. It is possibly directed, uh, directed by the highways, by the pipes, through the nerves, and also through the connective tissue, which is full of microtubules. Uh, so the, the, the structure of morphic field could be much more structured mechanically than uh, it is thought before. So it could be trans traveling through the microtubules. So how to crack the brain code? Uh, as I said, if we crack the DNA code, we can uh, crack, it, um, crack the brain code. Again, we can use experimental genomics and see how doing the candidate res changing the candidate resonant sequences in the DNA can change the mind and can be done on mice and others. And also we have some candidate sequences. Uh, implications of cracking the brain code. Um, so physical therapy for psychiatry. You can use electromagnetic devices for physical therapy. Mind enhancement. Unfortunately, it also opens the doors for the mind control. Once you crack the brain code, <laughs> it opens the doors for the mind control. And also it opens the door for technology-assisted telepathy. Let's define the telepathy. Telepathy in Wikipedia is defined as communication from mind to mind without the use of physical senses. So we can use computer to, to link it to the or technology to link it to the one mind and then to another mind and make an interface, transferring the information. And the idea is that the information transfer would circumvent the voice and the imperfections of the language and go directly so that the, the, it's, it's similar like going from a slow internet speed to super high internet speed. Much more information can be transferred and much less distortion will happen on the way once it's perfected, once it's perfected. So, so I would say that once it's done, telepathy will improve learning and communication. Imagine a teacher connected to the students or teacher connected to the students and transferring the information directly. How much faster can you transfer and how much clearer will be connection? Also, vo voluntary groups can be formed and uh, it will improve the teamwork when the group can think as one mind connecting together and it will enable, enable telepathic communities. Imagine a community where people are linked together into telepathic link. Now, I say the crisis of humanity is from uh, the stalemate in many areas. Look at this intersection. I mean, the stoplight stopped working. People didn't follow the rules and they blocked each other. And if you look closely, if you take this car out, all of these cars can move out and these cars can move and everybody is happy and everything is resolved. So only one car is blocking for every, everybody from, from kind of get, getting resolved. So imagine those people connected telepathically, uh, being able to assess for the situation, being able to develop a plan and convince this person to temporarily step out. Uh, and that can happen in the humanity and many other problems in politics, science, uh, so, uh, social, things and social problems and economical problems can be resolved when there is more cooperation and more altruism. You just need to be able to communicate clearer. Now, deception is one of the biggest problems of the society. So people believe that you cannot do commerce without deceiving. And now I put uh, helmets, telepathic helmets on these people and they cannot lie anymore. You can read the mind. And now the sales profession would be only about uh, giving information without deceiving. You cannot actually deceive if uh, there is a wide, if you expose your brain to others. 
And also deception will, uh, removal of deception that will prevent dishonest leadership, which is a plague of the humanity. Any commune or any community is plagued by, by the dishonest leadership, deceptive leadership. And finally, it will increase connecting people in the network. It will increase connectivity between uh, people, and it will lead to a dimensional jump. The humanity will shift dimensionally when the, the humans connect uh, together. So I would say the pros of telepathy are much better than, uh, much stronger than the dangers of the mind control. And what's interesting here, the interests of the humanity to de develop telepathy is in line with, in, with, uh, with the people who fund their development. So it's possible to go into the mainstream with this idea. So how to make the devices for technology-assisted telepathy? As, as uh, the unique approach which I propose as experimental genomics, you can actually understand that DNA is the key for telepathy. You can do experiments with genomics. You can do actually genome screen to find the people who are telepathically talented. There are, there are prayers of people who are capable of telepathy. So you can genome, uh, genetically identify those and understand which sequences are involved. You can develop mind-to-mind -mind interface using DNA ideas. You can synchronize people using biofeedback, and we developed a prototype uh, which is ready for testing, which would synchronize people so people could stop listening from the noise from everybody, but tune into each other and actually receive information from one person instead of everybody else. Uh, would your device enhance telepathy? There is a lot of interesting devices around. Suppose you two people can be linked together through your special waves or synchronized through the special waves or linked through some sort of a special water solution and that would transfer uh, information. That would be a, uh, an opportunity. So I'm experienced in applying for funding from NIH and not yet from defense agencies, but I would be interested to collaborate and find uh, people with the devices to propose some mind to computer interface using special devices and with the idea to develop telepathy and we would uh, submit the grant together or you can submit uh, yourself. And I would like to thank um, Richard Allen Miller for helping with uh, understanding his holographic concept, Dan Winter for helping with understanding of um, fractal ideas, uh, Garyaev with explanation on his, uh, for explanation on his experiments in DNA uh, Resonance, uh, uh, and Alex Burlakov for helping establish the experiments. Uh, our collaborators on microtubule therapy, physics, and neurobiology. Thank you. And um, um, I would like to thank Ivan Savelyev, uh, who was key to developing uh, those theories, and Nelly Zuryanova, and also Jane Kanonikin, who did um, the experimental work, and Jane Golovina, who is starting some computational biolo bi biology project, uh, computational genomics project. And these are my contacts. I, I, I invite questions. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, question and answer, uh, come on up. Uh, we request you come to the microphone before you start asking your question. Thank you. So I uh, had a question about your model. When you presented uh, the movement of electrons as they fl as the, through the DNA, as the DNA is wrapped around the histones in the nucleus. Uh, th your theory, uh, the picture that you show yeah, way back there somewhere, <laughs> Uh, had uh, only negative, that one, only negative charges. Uh, but in fact, DNA also transduces uh, positive charges in the form of protons. So bearing that in mind, how would you modify this model considering there are now both positive and negative charges zipping around the molecule? Oh, I, I showed only one charge for simplicity. Obviously, if negative charge goes away from another negative charge, between them there is positive charge. So. So I show only half of the picture. Obviously, there is positive and negative in the same picture. Yeah, I, I, I'd like you to incorporate that, uh, the active motion of the protons in addition to the electrons. Um, yes, I say that's great. <laughs> and actually, I have a hypothesis that protons are actually unified in a, in a stream there, but 
It's not proven yet, yes. Okay, thank you. I'm not quite clear. Have you discovered resonance frequencies that you're using now, or are you still looking for them? Can you repeat, please? Have you discovered resonance frequencies that you, that you are using now in doing some of your uh, discovery, or are you still looking for some resonance frequencies? Um, one of the favorite ones is 42.2 gigahertz, just because of it is popular in therapy. 42.2 gigahertz, okay. uh, 7 millimeter is popular in therapy. Um, red light is interesting, UV light is interesting. I am also interested in looking at much shorter wavelengths, which is like nanometers, because many of DNA structures are actually nanometers, and that opens a very different physics. It's close to gamma rays, x-rays, and beyond, but possibly there is some resonation there through, not through electromagnetic waves, but through quantum, some sort of quantum phenomena. Right. Yeah, well, biology isn't my area at all, but I remember back in the 80s, we came across a paper where people had published the uh, visible, uh, absorb visible spectrum absorption frequencies for the four base pairs. And uh, we looked at it and played with it just for fun. And uh, it occurred to me that uh, if you're looking for any resonance, and it could be at several different harmonic you know, levels, it could be in any octave that, you, that you're looking at, you might try to add these things together. I, I don't see why you can't heterodyne uh, two of the base pairs. They have definitive visual uh, spectrum uh, absorption fr uh, frequencies. We stepped them down to the audio frequencies just for fun. They sound awful. But when we put them, uh, but you could uh, actually take a base pair, a base pair, a base pair, however many you want to add, heterodyne those signals together, and maybe you'll come up with something that will actually resonate for a certain chunk of that DNA that will give you what you need to get into the morphic field. Have you looked at any of that? Kind yes, of? absolutely. Um, yes, I think. So going from the biology perspective, um, three nucleotides is a meaningful, three bases is a meaningful biological unit. Okay. Then uh, there are interesting biological units of about 20 nucleotides and then bigger like 300 nucleotides. So yes, start looking at this range of the sequences, so from th between 3 and 50, you can, you can play with those. Mm. Um, obviously, we believe that um, DNA has a very wide range of frequencies. And one of the oscillations, which is actually I saw it on an experimental data, was an oscillation. An os oscillation every two minutes it would breathe, uh, with a period of two minutes. So it's uh, not even measured in hertz; it's measured in fractions of a hertz. Mm -hmm. So it's anywhere from very high to very low. Mm -hmm. But yes, spectroscopy is a very great tool to to play. And with. the last thing I, I, I said, this isn't my area, but I. I understand that they've actually measured uh, superconductivity along the, uh, along the backbone of the DNA uh, he uh, helix. Is that not true? I mean, I think I read a paper about that. I, yeah, I mean, okay. there is a claim of superconductivity. And yeah. basically, uh, I mean, you can take the DNA, uh, modify it so there is a place where you insert the, f the electron using chemical m way, and then you measure how far it goes. Surprisingly, the distance, where, how far it goes, uh, the signal, you can measure chemically how far it went. It doesn't fade with the distance. It, it is equal, is, um, the distance is where it gets out, it doesn't fade with the distance. It can be 10 nucleotides or it can be 5,000, there is no difference. Mm. So okay. just the, the superconductivity, yes. Uh, also, I believe the DNA has to be alive in proper water structure, in proper protein structure. It has to be pumped with some energy using ATP and chemical energy, so it is really alive. I was wondering, because of the structure of DNA is all right-handed, it's a right-handed spiral, have you been using any polarized ways to try to resonate with DNA, like right-handed clockwise ways only? There are yeah, earlier you said the depiction of DNA is wrong half the time. Is that because they paint a left-handed DNA? This is I've, the last I've seen the depictions of DNA painted left-handed, and it makes me cringe. So. Yeah. So it's, it's just not from our universe. Our life is right-handed DNA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there are papers. People uh, use polarized waves and also spiral waves. Spiral it's waves, It's also right. available, yeah. Mm, it's a great um, therapeutic candidate, which would, I would be happy to play with those instruments. I don't have much of uh, that, f that expertise, but I think that's a great candidate. If you spiralize the wave 
at this angle, and mm -hmm. this angle, and this angle, would it have different therapeutic properties? Because there are already waves which are therapeutic, like red light, UV, uh, millimeter waves, 42 gigahertz. If you spiralize them, maybe they would be like super therapeutic. Mm -hmm. That's what I was thinking. Thank you. And maybe different sequences, different fragments of DNA, different sequences would have different angles. So you would uh, uh, use, by varying the angle, you, would, you can measure the, I'm activating this part of the genome, I'm activating this part of the genome. Yeah. Um, I understand that um, DNA holds on to or emits photons. What is the role of photons in DNA that you found? That's a mystery. Healthy DNA emits very few photons, but they are very coherent. And when it dies, it emits tons of photons and they're incoherent. They are not coordinated to each other. That's sort of, lots of ex publications show that. So, so if there are too few photons, then we would think that there is not enough to communicate information. It would, this photon will be lost very fast. So if it is not photons, then what it is? So that's a great question which we don't know the answer. I say it's either that uh, one, one of the possibilities that the, the, the field, the resonance happens without the actual carrier wave. There is no sound, no optoacoustic message, no electromagnetic message between two pieces of DNA. They just resonate because they do it quantum physically through some sort of uh, spooky action at the distance. It's quite a possibility. Another option that there are, say, ultraviolet photons which wouldn't go very far. They would be absorbed really fast. And there are red photons, infrared photons, which should go into centimeters. And uh, so you can play with different wavelengths and hopefully we can find the ones which, which go far. Constantin Mayle uh, speculated on that and he said regular wave would be stuck in the biological tissue, but spiral waves can go easily and they can easily adjust the shape to go through in, in irregular sequences, irregular patterns. And do you think these are emitting scalar energy fields? I mean, that's the main suspicion, yes. Thank you. A small detail about this, these um, 42 mega gigahertz devices that are uh, used in Eastern uh, Europe. Uh, is this a continuous wave or is that used as a carrier wave for some other modulation? Yes, both. Uh, continuous has therapeutic properties. If I touch the continuous wave, I don't feel it. I mean, I didn't find any person who can feel it. If you put a simple pulsed wave at 50 hertz, you can feel it pretty strongly. And they also modulate at megahertz too. So uh, there are different devices. Unfortunately, they don't disclose as much information. It looks like one of the interesting properties is they go into 42 gigahertz and then go a little up and down in frequency uh, at a megahertz level, so that's what they do. And then kind of massages something and makes it more efficient. Ladies and gentlemen, Max.